Tonight, how to keep young people from being locked up behind bars. Keep kids close to home and be able to rehabilitate them and ensure they're getting back on their feet. The bipartisan effort to bring youth prison reforms to Texas. Plus, prioritizing Texas energy. It's a plan that will secure our future on the Texas grid. A proposal the lieutenant governor says will fix the electric grid once and for all. And later, the Texas congressman who heads the powerful House Foreign Affairs Committee joins us to discuss his push to send Ukraine more aid in its fight against Russia. Capital Tonight starts right now. Thanks for joining us here on Capital Tonight. I'm Karina Kling. Texas's youth prisons are at a crossroads, and state lawmakers are calling for drastic changes. The juvenile justice department's been entrenched in crisis for more than a decade, including claims of abuse and mistreatment. Last year, the five prisons neared total collapse. Officers fled the job, teachers and caseworkers had to take on security roles, and youth were often locked alone in their cells nearly 24 hours. Recent reforms have helped stabilize staffing, but some lawmakers say the current system is ineffective. And as our Charlotte Scott reports, one is pushing to shut them all down. Abolish youth prisons, liberate the youth. Abolish youth prisons, liberate the youth. Eight youth prisons have closed in the past decade, but a group of Texans is on a mission to shut down the last five. Not prison. Now, Austin area representative James Tallarico has filed legislation to do just that. He wants to close the prisons by 2030. The incarceration that we inflict on our kids causes unimaginable trauma. If this bill if passes, Representative Tallarico says kids would go back to their hometowns and enroll in county-run rehabilitation programs. He says the $300 million that's spent on youth prisons every year should go to local initiatives instead. All the research, all the evidence says that these interventions, probation, mental health treatment, anti-violence programs, are all most effective when they are done closer to home, closer to families, closer to support systems. It's something Jernard Brown supports. He spent three years in Evans Regional Juvenile Center. He still has nightmares from what happened there. I had no sexual abuse, but most of it was verbal and physical abuse. Representative Tallarico also wants to dissolve the Texas Juvenile Justice Department and replace it with the Office of Youth Safety and Rehabilitation. But other lawmakers and the department itself want to try to fix the failing system by building more prisons. Chandra Carter, the agency's executive director wrote in a statement to Spectrum News, we are building a comprehensive continuum that will serve the needs of our communities and youth at every level in our juvenile justice system. Representative Joe Moody has filed similar legislation to divert kids from juvenile prisons into local programs. It's a priority for Republican House Speaker Dade Phelan. And staying close to home is something Brown would have appreciated. He was eight hours away from his mom when he was in prison. He doesn't want other kids to go through what he did. We have kids with so much potential to be so great, but we have yet to pour or invest in them. Liberate the youth! Closing the last five youth prisons is something Brown and others will continue to fight for this legislative session. For Capital Tonight, I'm Charlotte Scott. We want to bring in Alicia Welch now. She's the Associate Director of the Prison and Jail Innovation Lab at the University of Texas at Austin. Alicia, thanks for being on the program. Um, I know that you developed an alternative to incarceration program for young adults. So how feasible is this push by Representative Tallarico to close all youth prisons? Yeah, thank you so much for having me. Um, we've closed facilities here in Texas before. Between 2007 and 2011, the state closed eight of its youth prisons mm -hmm. and shifted the resources to communities in an effort to keep youth closer to home. So it certainly is possible, and Texas has shown that it's possible. Um, the feasibility of whether or not um, Representative Tallarico's bill will um, effectively close the existing five youth prisons and shift the remaining resources to community really depends on the plan that is developed um, under the bill and um, ultimately the funding that the legislature appropriates to support um, the mechanisms that will be involved with the plan that's developed. Yeah, I mean, do you think that this would be more beneficial to, say, these community programs and, and what could come of not having uh, youth prisons in the state? 
Well, given what we know about um, brain development, we know that youth have diminished culpability as compared to that of adults, as well as a much greater capacity for change. We know that keeping youth closer to home is less disruptive of youth's developmental progress, and that provides youth with the tools that they need um, to manage and handle um, negative influences and um, points of stress. And those um, stresses that youth face um, in youth prisons uh, youth simply aren't given the adequate tools that they need to really understand their behavior, understand the factors that are contributing to their behavior, and most importantly, better ways to respond to that behavior. Whereas community-based supports and services uh, really are targeted at doing just that. And I know we're seeing it as a, as a priority and on a lesser scale of not closing all the prisons, but more of this community-based programs being pushed this legislative session as well. Uh, lastly, I mean, you talked about the investment that would be needed and what kind of an investment is needed to, to reform the system, to uh, be able to do this and do it in a way that is most effective and most beneficial. It's a absolutely important question and really um, the success of this plan will hinge on the amount of funding that the legislature de decides to appropriate for the plan. Um, I cannot provide an order of magnitude. We'll have to see what the details of the plan are that come out. Um, but I think it's important to note that um, for the existing agency, the Texas Juvenile Justice Department, Funding levels have just not kept pace with the agency's needs. So legislators um, and advocates and experts working with these youth will need to keep their eye um, on funding levels and ensure that policymakers understand the importance of ensuring that adequate resources are put towards the community-based programs and services that are contemplated um, by this bill and that will be included in the plan that comes out of it. Alicia Welch, we will have to leave it there. We'll get you back on. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate you covering this important issue. You bet. Texas senators announced their plans today to fix the power grid. The proposals come two years after the deadly winter storm that nearly shut it down. The ideas are meant to get companies to build more of what's known as dispatchable power or power that can turn on or off at any time. The proposals would also create a state-backed low-cost loan program to cover maintenance or modernization for current dispatchable power generators and allocate service costs for different facilities depending on how much power they generate each year. Lieutenant Governor Dan Patrick said the bills won't fix the issue right away, but they'll put Texas on the right track. Now we know that it will take several years from this day forward to get plants in the ground to add more power, which we need. We need more power. Uh, but this is the beginning of that process. Environmental advocates criticize the plan as a costly favor to fossil fuel interest groups. Let's get a check now of some of the other political stories making headlines today. Texas could loosen its restrictions on liquor sales. A bill filed in the state Senate would allow grocery stores to sell ready to drink cocktails seven days a week. Liquor, Texas liquor stores close on Sundays and grocery stores are limited to beer and wine. This comes two years after Texas allowed restaurants to sell to-go drinks and permitted beer and wine sales on Sunday mornings. In his latest round of priorities, House Speaker Dave Phelan is promoting legislation aimed at improving Texas schools and safety. He wants districts to adopt active shooter preparedness plans, expand funding for mental health programs, and give more financial support to retired teachers. The man accused of killing 10 people at a high school in Houston nearly five years ago could undergo more testing to see if he's fit for trial. According to the Houston Chronicle, prosecutors say the judge is expected to ask a new psychiatrist to determine if the alleged shooter is mentally competent enough. A status conference is scheduled for tomorrow. 
A federal judge ended a program that released migrants from Border Patrol custody and put them on parole while they pursued their immigration case. Republican critics have called the policy catch and release. The Biden administration argued the program eased the burden on Border Patrol agents and reduced overcrowding in migrant facilities. Migrant encounters are expected to increase as COVID-19 restrictions come to an end. The White House is considering detaining migrants at the border to deal with the predicted influx. Predicted influx. The government has a week to appeal. President Biden revealed his new budget proposal today. He said it would extend social programs while still reducing the deficit and the wealthiest Americans would pick up the tab. Karina Capabianca has more from Washington. President Joe Biden traveled to Philadelphia to propose his $6.8 trillion budget. Biden is calling for higher taxes on corporations and the rich to lower the deficit, expand social programs, and extend the life of Medicare. I guarantee you, I will protect Social Security and Medicare without any change. Guaranteed. The proposal would increase taxes on stock buybacks, billionaires, those earning more than $400,000 a year, and some corporations. At the same time, it would expand pre-kindergarten and health care, lower drug costs, restore the expanded child tax credit, and stabilize Medicare's finances, all while reducing the deficit. For too long, working people have been breaking their necks, but the economy's left them behind. Working people like you... With Republicans now controlling the House of Representatives, the plan has almost no chance of passage. But the White House believes it sets up a politically favorable comparison with Republicans, who have broadly called for deep spending cuts but have not yet put forward a plan. This as both parties begin gearing up for next year's election. I think budgets are really important. They, they set out values, and the president's values, since he's been in office, has been investing uh, in the American people. This looming budget battle is part of a larger confrontation over the nation's borrowing limit. Republicans have said they will not lift the debt ceiling unless Democrats agree to deep spending cuts. Biden says the limit should be raised with no strings attached. Failure to raise the borrowing limit would leave the government unable to pay its bills this summer, potentially damaging the economy. Every single major economic institution, conservative or liberal, says that will cause a massive recession. House Speaker Kevin McCarthy and Republican House leadership said Biden's proposal was reckless and that they must cut wasteful government spending. In Washington, Karina Capabianca, Capitol Tonight. So to come on Capitol Tonight, aiding Ukraine, how the Texas congressman who chairs the House Foreign Affairs Committee is pressing for more support. Welcome back to Capitol Tonight. Part of the president's budget unveiled today includes more than $6 billion to support Ukraine. That amount would boost total U.S. spending to aid the country and its neighbors to more than $80 billion since Russia's invasion last year. A leading House Republican from Texas has called on Biden to increase military support and continue to fund the effort. And he joins us now. Austin area Congressman Michael McCall is the chair of the House Foreign Affairs Committee. Congressman McCall, welcome back to the program. Nice to see you. Hi, nice, Karina. Thanks for having me. I want to get to several issues with you, but um, regarding the support to Ukraine, I mean, are you in favor of that, that further support? You know, I am, but uh, we went right in the appropriations bill, the military strategy. I think this administration is taking too long, walking too slow uh, with the process. We give them just enough to survive and bleed through the uh, Russian offensive taking place right now, but not enough for victory. Um, and this has been the case from day one. And if we can't give them enough for victory, why are we in this at all? I will tell you the stakes are high because what happens in Ukraine could happen in Taiwan tomorrow. China and Russia are in a close alliance on this, as is Iran and North Korea. And these Iranian drones in Crimea, the Ukrainians that just hit 80 uh, missiles hit last night in Ukraine, uh, that the Ukrainians have a hard time responding to because we're not giving them the adequate uh, weapon systems. Well, I mean, you're speaking to this, and it was vague in terms of how the funds would be allocated. So where do you think the money is most needed, is most effective? I know that you've been in favor of sending the F-16 fighter jets to Ukraine. Right. I mean, I, again, we've slow walked it so much. I, I think the longer range artillery to hit these uh, missiles coming out of Crimea, the Iranian drones, 
Uh, the F-16s could help with the cruise missiles that were fired, uh, 80 of them last night. Um, you know, and I was in the region just recently in Kyiv, and I saw the Ukrainians being trained on the Leopard tanks. Every time we give them what they need, they win. The problem is this administration uh, keeps backpedaling. And so uh, we, if we drag this out, it only airs to Putin's benefit. And that's exactly what he wants right now. And if we want the American people to continue to support this conflict, uh, we got to put the right weapon systems uh, in there. Congressman, uh, you've been very critical of the, the withdrawal from Afghanistan and held your first hearing yesterday uh, as chairman of this committee. I mean, what do you hope to accomplish with these hearings? I think our veterans uh, deserve answers. I, I think our gold star mothers uh, deserve answers as to what happened in this evacuation, uh, holding people accountable so this never happens again. You know, we heard powerful testimony from a, a sniper, you know, a, a sergeant who was in the control tower at the Abbey Gate, you know, at the Hkaya Airport in Kabul, who, uh, when given identification of the, the suicide bomber, actually uh, saw him. He identified the suicide bomber. He asked for permission to engage. After he consulted with his team and the PSYOPs organization, <clears throat> asked for permission to engage and was never given an answer to that. Imagine had he engaged and taken out that suicide bomber, it would have saved 13 servicemen and women, 140 Afghanistans, and stopped uh, 47 from being injured. But instead, uh, that explosion took place. And I talked to the mother of a Marine Sergeant, a female officer who was blown up that day, along with many others. And the sad thing is, Karina, it didn't have to happen. Sure. They had him. They had him in their sights, and they had to let him go. Um, speaking to that, and I know that you've been a, a staunch critic of the president on uh, some issues, uh, that being one of them. But what are your? What about your approach and your in your new role as chairman of the House Foreign Affairs Committee? I mean, you've been pushing working across the aisle on many issues. How do you think that will play out? I think you know when you talk about matters of national security, foreign policy. Uh, it's always better that we stand united rather than divided. For instance, the spy balloon incident, my resolution, mm -hmm. uh, I worked very hard to make it bipartisan and it passed 419 to zero. Why is that important? Because we need to stand united against our four nation adversaries, that being Russia, China, Iran, North Korea. They would love nothing more than to see us divided under uh, party lines. So I do think that's important as we face one of the biggest threats I've seen probably since my father's war of World War II as Putin invaded Ukraine, largest invasion since World War II, Chairman Xi threatening Taiwan and the Pacific, Iran getting close to a nuclear bomb, uh, and North Korea. And finally, the turning point in my judgment, Karina, happened with Afghanistan. That's when our foreign adversaries saw weakness, and weakness always invites aggression. Congressman McCall, we will have to leave it there. We hope you'll come back and talk to us soon. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Karina. Thanks for having me. A Mexican cartel is claiming responsibility for the kidnapping of four Americans. Members of the group allegedly left an apology note on a pickup truck where the two survivors were found in Matamoros. They also turned over five cartel members to Mexican police. Mexican investigators say the kidnappers likely mistook the Americans as rival human traffickers. At last check, the two survivors are recovering at a Texas hospital. The bodies of the other two Americans were brought back into the U.S. today. Some federal lawmakers are renewing calls to declare drug cartels as terrorist groups. The White House has placed sanctions on several Mexican companies and people connected to the illegal drug trade. Still to come on Capitol tonight, a railroad CEO faced a Senate grilling over a toxic train derailment. What lawmakers are looking at to shore up rail safety. Welcome back to Capitol Tonight. Texas has the most miles of railroad, and that's why many are following the train derailment in Ohio. The accidents raised questions about the railroad industry as a whole. Taylor Poplars has more on the bipartisan push for answers 
and for change. My primary focus right now is getting my family and my community that are dying out of there. Jamie Koza and her partner Chris Wallace traveled to Washington from East Palestine to make clear to lawmakers and Norfolk Southern CEO Alan Shaw just how much last month's train derailment has affected them and their community. We, we live in the United States of America um, and the fact that I'm watching my whole community slowly die it's disgusting. Koza lives in the derailment zone alongside nearly 50 other immediate family members. She hasn't been back to her home since the February 3rd accident. We've had those houses in our family, the land in our family for generations and generations and generations. Like, we're never going to be made whole. Shaw appeared before a Senate committee Thursday to apologize and pledge help beyond the $21 million in aid Norfolk Southern has already provided. I am determined to make this right. But he faced bipartisan criticism for the derailment, the release of toxic chemicals, and broader challenges facing the rail industry. Ohio Senator Sherrod Brown and J.D. Vance, a Democrat and Republican, testified together to make the case for bipartisan legislation they introduced to increase rail safety. Brown accused the company of being greedy. If Norfolk Southern had paid a little more attention to safety and a little less attention to its profits, he had cared a little more about the Ohioans along its tracks and a little less about its executives and shareholders, these accidents would not have been as bad or maybe not happened at all. Vance made a plea to fellow Republicans who are skeptical that new regulations would help prevent future accidents. A particular slice of people who seem to think that any public safety enhancements for the rail industry is somehow a violation of the free market. Well, if you look at this industry and what's happened in the last 30 years, that argument is a farce. Vance told reporters afterward that he thinks the legislation can pass the Senate, but that the Republican-led House remains a sticking point. In reality, this is a very reasonable response. It's not going to burden the railroads in an unnecessary or unreasonable way, and it actually will enhance public safety. Brown appreciated his attempt. I think Senator Vance made a good appeal to his own party. Shaw would not endorse the bill outright. As for the East Palestine residents who attended the hearing, they said their priority is to get Norfolk Southern to reimburse those who want to relocate, pay for long-term health care, and help their community find a new sense of stability. Words mean nothing. I want to see action. In Washington, Taylor Popolars, Capital Tonight. And that is going to do it for this edition of Capital Tonight. We are back tomorrow with the latest in Texas politics. Until then, thanks for watching, stay safe, and have a great night. Thanks for watching our YouTube channel. For more refreshing stories about your community, click the subscribe button over here. You can also download our Spectrum News app and tune in to Channel 55 on DISH and DirecTV to get live news coverage, weather updates every 10 minutes, and more. We'll see you then.